listening to Beyond Wellness Radio, bringing you the cutting edge in health, nutrition, and sports performance. Stay up to date and listen anywhere, anytime on your computer, tablet, or smartphone by subscribing on iTunes. Catch your hosts, Dr. Justin Marchegiani and Barris Harvey, as they answer your burning health questions, as well as interviews from world-renowned guest experts. For more Beyond Wellness Radio, go to beyondwellnessradio.com. Thank you guys for tuning in to another episode of Beyond Wellness Radio. In today's show, we are talking about anemia, and I know this is an issue for a lot of people. So first off, I want to say thank you guys for tuning in, and how's it going today, Dr. Jackson? Barris, it's going great, and actually just for everyone at home, we're, we're on location today. Uh, Barris is in Austin, Texas, and we couldn't quite figure out how to record it on the same um, computer in the same room. So Barris is actually in my family room while I'm across my house in my office. So it kind of feels weird, but it's uh, quite, just thought everyone would like to appreciate that a uh, little bit of side info. Yeah, definitely. If if I were, were to, to get up, I'm, I'm too comfortable now, but if I were to get up, I can peek over and, and actually see. <laughs> I know. Uh, well, I, I got you set up on the recliner with some mixed nuts and uh, the fan going. So you're, I think you're dialed in. <laughs> Oh, yeah. I'm ready to roll. This is probably going to be one of the the best, at least in my perspective, one of the best uh, podcasts. Yes, I think so, too. And I also wanted to let everyone know that we're going to have all of the podcasts moving forward dictated with show notes, with kind of a summary, full translation, uh, YouTube and podcast uh, mp3 as well so moving forward we're just adding that full service because you've demanded it we've listened and we're trying to provide as best service as possible so you can go to beyondwellnessradio.com that will forward over to justinhealth.com slash podcast where all the podcasts will be housed so feel free you can go to the old url which forwards over or the new one which is justinhealth.com slash podcast yeah definitely so it, it, we're, we made it a lot more simplistic for you guys and uh, over there at Dr. Justin's um, justinhealth.com, there's a lot of blog content that you can read up on as well. So this makes it easier for you guys to, to get access to the information that, uh, that you need. So, uh, of course, the first question has to be... Oh, and I also want to say one thing. We also, <laughs> we're going to have some links there, too, to your site as well. And oh, yeah. Would you mind yeah. sharing your site, Barris? Yeah, so... I have uh, the healthitarians.com, which is it's going going through some changes right now, and and same thing with uh, reallyhealthynow.com. But there's a, a a lot of lot of cool cool changes uh, going on, and so uh, I'm excited, and uh, and I'm excited to share those. Um, but with that being said, what did you have for breakfast today? And and we can even maybe talk about lunch because we're actually doing an afternoon. A po- is this a, this is like one of the first afternoon podcasts? Actually. Yeah. yeah, it's actually five o'clock now, so it's almost night. <laughs> yeah. Well, today was uh just a, today was a bulletproof fasting day. MCT, mm-hmm. uh, butter, coffee. But you were here for lunch, and um, lunch was I just had my rotisserie chicken. I just picked off all the extra meat <laughs> around the chicken, and had an avocado, and then we're like, oh shoot, I we got to get this podcast going. So I did four grass fed or pasture fed, I should say, uh, organic eggs, Rocky style, downed them, mm-hmm. and then had a tablespoon of butter and a carrot, and that was it. And then I, my cat ate lunch with me as well, and I gave him some of the carcass, and uh, Paleo Kitty also got a, a little scoop of grass-fed butter that he downed in a second. Oh, yeah. I looked over, and he was, he was all over it. Oh, absolutely. Uh, Carnivores got to get their uh, got to get their meat in, right? And Absolutely. Fat. And my Definitely. cats get the best. They're they're spoiled. They're picky as heck. They, <laughs> they eat grain free. They I try to go as organic and clean, but you know they get picky. So I gotta find something they actually eat, but also you know meets good standards. Sounds sounds like my puppy. My puppy <laughs> is uh is very very picky. He actually eats what we eat. Oftentimes he doesn't even eat uh, the food if it's cold. Yeah. If it it needs to be like. He he looks at me like, well, why is your why is your steak warm? I want my steak just as warm. And I'm like, oh, you picky dog. But he's a happy dog though, so that's that's what matters. That's good. Um, and that's pretty rare. Typically, dogs will eat almost anything. So that's yeah. You you got a high maintenance pup. Oh yeah, we we like to to say that is a very bougie dog. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, definitely. So I, I had one of those simple days as well, where I just had. When I came over, I literally had a can of uh, of some salmon, um, 
looked like tuna, but it was yep. it was some salmon in there. And oh, that's what that was. Okay. Yeah, and just and you had you had that uh Latino hot sauce that I love. Yes. So I was like, I saw that in, in your fridge, and I'm like, oh, I had to put some. You have the hot sauce, and it, it just makes it all makes it all beautiful. So I had some of that. Um, it had a had a protein shake that you had here, but uh, because because we always get caught on these Fridays where our, our meals are kind of boring. I wanted to tell you what I what I ate last Friday. Uh, coming out here to to Austin, um, I actually got taken taken out by Garrett, who was if you guys listened to one of our older podcasts, we had him on the show. And there's a pork chop place out here, which is amazing. It's called Perry. So if you guys ever get the chance to come down here. It's beyond belief. Nice. So all this red meat talk really has me excited, excited to talk about anemia. So, Love it. So we have a, a lot of people, and, and this, is, this is something that's close to home for me. Uh, I haven't had anemia, but personally, in the, in the past, even some recently as well, um, had times where I've been lightheaded, and maybe because I've... Uh, very active and yeah, and maybe not had the nutrient base that I needed. But I've had times where I've been lightheaded. I uh, have fainted um, before in the past. Uh, my sister has, has fainted, and, and she's anemic, and she takes uh, certain iron supplements. And same thing with my mom. Um, but there's other things that that I've been working with them to start. To, help them to start to change and they're seeing improvements and that's also about the type of supplementation Mm -hmm. but with that being said there's so many people that are dealing with anemia before we just kind of go go into it and devour it um what's a little bit of the overview i think the general idea is people just know that hey my my blood doesn't (laughs) isn't working right and that's kind of all people know is like iron and for some reason my blood and iron but there's so much to it. So uh, I'm going to go ahead and break down what, what's kind of happening with uh, anemia. So anemia is basically just like result. It's basically blood that's just not healthy. It's either mm. too big or too small to keep it simple. And we have genetic forms of anemia like thalassemia or sickle cell anemia, things like that, which are maybe more genetic based. But for this show, we're going to just keep it simple. right? We have our are microcytic anemia, right? Microcytic hypochromic, that's the technical term. We keep it real simple here. It's your iron-based anemia where the red blood cells get small, okay? And then we have our big cell anemia or a macrocytic anemia, macrocytic normochromic anemia or a megaloblastic anemia. And this tends to be where there's B vitamin deficiency, in particular B12, folate, and sometimes B6. So B12, B, folate, B6. So those are the two different kinds of anemia, just generally speaking. And then we can go into what the, what that actually means um, from a, a medical perspective. Okay, definitely. So n- nutri- you, you mentioned that either our red blood cells are too big or too small. What is the importance in that? Because um, this is something that I know if people dive into anatomy and really get deep into nutrition and, and how the body works, they'll know well that blood's supposed to be carrying oxygen and, and the, the hemoglobin carries oxygen and that's what matters. So it's almost like, like a boat going down the river trying to carry um, carry the fuel to to the rest of our, our body. So not having the right iron, not having the right B vitamins. What what are some of the the big symptoms of not having the the proper type of blood flowing through you, almost like your 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 stream in your body? What what would be some of the issues in in there? Uh, great question. So one of the first things that we're going to see with anemia that most people are fully aware of is just fatigue. Because mm-hmm. think about it, right? Especially when we're dealing with an iron-based anemia where the cells are too small, the, the red blood cells are too small. So if we're, we run a blood test, one of the first things we're going to see on our typical CBC is we're going to see three values called red blood cells, RBCs, hematocrit, and hemoglobin. Okay? Mm-hmm. And these markers tend to be a little bit on the lower side when we have 
iron-based anemia. Those are the first things we'll see. We'll see red blood cells almost below 4. We'll see hemoglobin you know, below 12. We'll see hematocrit in the lower range, the lower 10% of the range, 20% of the range as well. So that gives us a good starting point that we're starting to be low in iron. And again, there are other markers that can give us earlier detection as well, such as our iron markers like TIBC. UIBC, iron saturation, iron serum, and ferritin. We're going to go into those later, but I'm just setting the tone there. So regarding the symptoms, getting back to the symptoms now, Barris, mm -hmm. fatigue is a big one because with iron-based anemia, the iron is essential to being attached to the hemoglobin to carry oxygen. So if any of us go back to high school science class where we have the candle, and then we light a candle and we put the mason jar on top of the candle, Mm -hmm. One of the biggest things that we see is the candle goes out in just a matter of time. Mm -hmm. That's one of the big things we see. So that's important because if we're not carrying oxygen, we're not going to be able to have cellular metabolism because we need oxygen for that to happen. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah. So I guess in, in the inverse way, I was actually just telling someone the other day, don't fight fire with fire, deprive it of its oxygen, and then it, and then it has no fuel. Um, that's what you wouldn't want to happen in your body, though. You wouldn't want to deprive your body of this essential. I think a, a good way to, to structure it, to really have a paradigm shift for people, is to start thinking of oxygen almost as a nutrient. When, yeah. if, if, if people think of it that way, all of a sudden it, it stops becoming, oh, I mean, it's just air. It's like, no, if someone you know, puts you in a chokehold and put pressure right on that, you know, right on your neck, all of a sudden, you're blocking those veins from getting the oxygen to your brain. I mean, you can go. You can go. Maybe if you're, you know, really die hard and and, and have a good metabolism, about a month without food, maybe a week without water, but ten minutes without oxygen, I don't know if you're coming back, buddy. <laughs> right? Yeah, I would say three minutes, maybe four. <laughs> the most without oxygen, forget it. You got some brain oh, yeah. damage going on. Oh yeah, definitely. So we know that. If we kind of restructure the idea of of oxygen being one of the one of that base metabolic like nutrient, we we kind of start to pay uh, a a bit more attention to this because I know some people are just like ah, iron, but it's usually the people that have you know fainted and just like wait I just momentarily lost consciousness and found myself on the floor. That's dangerous. Those are the people that okay I hit rock bottom. That's not a good feeling. Mm -hmm. uh, what's next? And it and we we know it's not just iron, right? It it could be other other things. So you mentioned the f fatigue. Um, yeah, we're also going to see yeah. things like weight gain because yeah. you know metabolism is so tied into being able to carry oxygen for aerobic respiration. Also, depression, uh, leaky gut, low thyroid because we need iron to make thyroid hormones. Mm -hmm. And again, a lot of times celiac or gluten sensitivity because a lot of times people that are low in iron, a lot of times their gut's inflamed and they're just not able to absorb the minerals because of inflammation in the gut and or low stomach acid. So there's a lot of different things that can drive this whole entire symptomatology around anemia. Yeah, definitely. Um, from an athlete's perspective, uh, I mean – knowing how it, a lot of this iron is going to be coming from like the really dark, dark leafy greens or like the darker meats. And we know, well, what are, what are our muscles? Uh, what are so, some of the issues that you might see with, I know that you might've worked with a, a significant amount of athletes and also a lot of female athletes um, who might even be more prone to having anemia. What are so, some of the, the first key things that they start noticing? Well, again, we're going to see the recovery issues, the weight gain, the depression. Energy is going to be a big one. Uh, circulation, feeling cold, right? Again, as yes. an athlete, they, they got to create energy. And if we're not creating energy, there's going to be a ton of problems. So I want to differentiate a, thing, a couple things because we're talking about the iron-based anemia now. We'll mm -hmm. shift gears to B12 or B vitamin anemia shortly. But Regarding iron anemia, you're going to see it more frequently in females, mm -hmm. just to be straight up. And the reason why is because women menstruate every month. Mm -hmm. Guys don't. So a lot of the problems I have with my guys is they're going to have excessive iron. That's a big one. Yep. Because 
we don't menstruate. So when guys have iron anemias, it's a problem. Most of the time, it's going to be because they're vegetarian. They're not eating red meat. They're not eating meat in general. They're more plant-based. That's going to be number one. Number two is you're going to see guys that are celiac or really gut inflamed, massive, massive leaky guts. And these are going to be people that you're going to, they're just not absorbing it and or have low stomach acid. So number one is kind of leaky gut, gut inflammation. Number two is going to be more diet based. Mm -hmm. Okay. So and, that's, and, yeah. Yeah. And I wanted to say something real quick because I know that there was a, a point someone made to me the other day about like the acid alkaline thing. And, and yes, we do want to be more overall alkaline in our body, so greens are, are great for you, but different parts of our body are <laughs> different pH, and I don't know if you, you know, have seen different metals in, in its entirety, like maybe not in food, but just, but uh, if you look at that, you'll know that you can't just throw that in a, a balanced uh, solution like water and expect that to dissolve and break down, uh, not saying that we're, I'm eating, you know, like, quarters and coins and other metals but like we have to remember that these these minerals i mean they're not the same they're in a, in a smaller um area but for us to actually have that reaction happen our our, stu our stomach uh has to be has to have the right environment to to break that down and actually draw from the nutrients a lot of people just think that they can just take a supplement and bam okay my iron's up but if you what if you you went to the bathroom and you saw that just the same way we, if you eat corn and you see corn came out like yeah. it didn't become a part of you it's the same thing as throwing up right, right. It just it was actually, the back yeah yeah there's actually a condition called pica p i c a where people are nutritionally deficient and they're eating like crazy stuff because their body is just freaking out and trying to get these minerals especially iron anemia iron and zinc's a big one but like these mm -hmm. people will literally eat animal feces they'll eat like paper clips or paint or they a common one you see it a lot good clinical diagnostic um, indicator and it's a little bit more normal is people chewing on ice that's a good one uh, sand dirt animal feces those probably aren't you know you're probably not, you're probably not hanging out with people that are eating <laughs> animal feces especially if it's you know um, someone close to you you're probably that's probably on your radar screen so you, I, I, it's funny that you mentioned that not that I know anybody personally that's done that just <laughs> But I did notice that the other day on TV, not the other day, it was probably a couple months ago, I always use that term, but it's funny because one side of me was like, oh, that person must be insane. But the other side of me was like, what innately in their body, the same way a dog that's being fed garbage just says like, hey, I'm just going to start eating this grass because I have to look somewhere. Like what innately is telling their body and saying, hey, dude, I don't know what you're eating, but Go eat that poop, cause at least it's, it's like you gotta be like your something has to be breaking down in your body so bad for your body to say, hey, maybe you know, whatever the maybe there's a little bit of good stuff left that the dog <laughs> didn't absorb and right. hopefully isn't that poop. Yeah, exactly. So looking at that right there, so we want to be eating things that are absorbable. So when it comes to iron, animal products are gonna be the best. I mean, you're gonna have some non-heme iron sources in vegetables, especially spinach and your greens, but it's not going to have the effect really of, of increasing your overall iron levels like animal products will. Mm -hmm. Definitely not. And the same thing when it comes to B12. But again, you can have some effect with vegetarian sources, but your best bang for your buck is going to be animal sources, especially darker cuts of meat. So that's a real important thing. And when it comes to looking at the iron, I already gave you a couple of markers. Let's continue to piggyback on that. Mm -hmm. So in case anyone's got their lab test out there and they're dealing with some of these symptoms, we also want to look at MCV, right? MCV is a it's your mean corpuscular volume. So it's looking at how big the hemoglobin is or how big your red blood cells are. So if that's small, that's starts to be a sign of iron deficiency. Also, mean corpuscular hemoglobin, MCH, and then even our MCHC. When these get lower, right, this starts to be a sign of iron deficiency. And I'll give you a couple of markers here. When we go below 82 on MCV, that's a big one, 82. So check the show notes for these on the, on the flip side if you want to refer back to below 27 on the MCH. 
and below 32 on the MCHC. So you'll have the translation to review this. But this is when we combine the red blood cells, the hemoglobin, the hematocrit, the MCV, MCHC, MCH, we have a pretty good window at what markers we're looking at to get a window of how our iron levels are. So that's, that's number one right there. And then number two, we can dig a little bit deeper at some of these other markers here called ferritin. Okay? Ferritin is a storage form of iron. It's kind of like 25-hydroxy-D. 25-hydroxy-D is the marker we use to look at our vitamin D, which is really important. We've done a whole bunch of podcasts and videos on that already, so refer back to those. We'll have that in the show notes. But vitamin D is really important. So ferritin is analogous to our 25-hydroxy vitamin D test. So it gives us a good window of storage form of iron. And we'll even look at these iron binding proteins such as UIBC and TIBC. And these markers are interesting because they're binding proteins. So imagine when the body wants more iron, these markers actually go up. So you think they may go down, but they actually go up because the body's trying to get more efficient at grabbing for iron. So low iron, we see higher amounts of these UIBC and TIBC protein markers. Okay, and then we'll also start to see serum iron drop, and we'll start to see iron saturation drop. But a lot of times, your conventional doctors won't run this type of comprehensive panel, and I see it many times every week. There's always at least one or two anemics that come into my office where we run this full comprehensive panel, and only one or two markers show up, or we start to see them drop at the lower end of the range. So with functional medicine evaluation, we can pull you know, these people and, and, and into the diagnostic criteria mm -hmm. because we're using more sensitive testing. So it's really helpful because we can pick them up before it's a, a big problem. Yeah, and then and with that testing too, what you're able to do is it's kind of track because if people really take a close look at the way that physiology and homeostasis and even <laughs> things at really small levels or even at really big levels just like how the sun rises and sets, things usually go, goes in curves. And that's one of the big issues that I see when people go into their, their doctors and their, their, norm, their, uh, their lab tests look normal. <laughs> the only thing is you can't tell if it's going, like they're usually getting caught on the way down. So it gets back into, oh, it's in that normal range, but what direction? <laughs> people usually don't notice that. So like you mentioned, um, it could be because it, you know, your your body starts to elevate those numbers because it's, tr it has to overcompensate at a certain point, and eventually it can only hold up so much, and those systems start to break down. And when those numbers start to fall back down, your doctor says, "Oh, look, you're in the normal range." Right. Maybe right. not. <laughs> right. Exactly. And then let me just piggyback on that and just give some of the other markers here. So. When we're talking about ferritin, that's the storage form of iron. Anytime we go below 30 on ferritin tests, that's a sign of, of lower iron. That's a sign of lower iron right there. Also, when your iron serum is below 85 and when our iron saturation is below 20. Those are some good markers. So review the show notes to get those dialed in. But if you look at your blood work and you see any of those, then we got some problems. And if you're eating meat already, especially red meat, and you're already eating leafy greens, then we got some serious issues because we got some gut infections going on here. We got some low stomach acid and more than likely some serious gut inflammation on top of that. Yeah, definitely. Now, I, ha I have a, a personal question. Um, will measuring your, your oxygen, like if you have one of those little... Uh, Finger, I don't know why. I yes, can't. A, think a, of, a pulse oximeter. Pulse oximeter. There you go. Um, well, having that around because they're not that expensive. You know, you can go into like Walgreens or CVS and find one. Um, if you know that there's an athlete or maybe um, or just someone with these symptoms, will having something like that be a good tracking tool for them? Well, it could be. I mean, when I'm adjusting and working with patients on a functional neurological level, we'll even put a pulse ox on them to see where they're where their O2 saturation is. And just for everyone, a uh, pulse oximeter, if you go on Amazon, it's a little device that clips onto your finger and it tells you your oxygen saturation. And ideally, you want to be upwards of you know, 97, 98, ideally. And when they see people drop below 95, 94, 93, it starts getting into the danger zone. And we'll even cut the treatment off 
depending on where they're at, um, if they're that low, because they're just not going to have enough uh, oxygen and be able to generate enough ATP to withstand the stimulus of the treatment. So it, it can be a good indicator, but the blood tests are going to be most important to get a complete clinical picture of what's going on. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Okay, now let's switch gears uh, a little bit. Um, and, it, and it's funny, too, because a lot of this stuff is going to come from the same um, food base, uh, but B vitamin deficiency. Yeah. Well, but let me let's... just let me. I, I think that's a great idea. I forgot to talk about iron supplementation, though. Oh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Let, let, yeah. Let, let's let's go there. So, so for, first of all, you know, we we always want, want to mention because sometimes we assume that the nu nutrition is is right. We want to make that uh, assumption um, because we believe that you guys are going to make sure you're eating the right foods first. So when we just when we start to go at the supplementation, it's not because we're saying, hey, do the supplementation, that's it you're good. We're saying if you're doing the diet parts first yes. and the lifestyle parts first and you're still having these issues, then maybe you just need kind of that that kickstarter and that yes. supplementation to get you back on the right track. And it's not always a forever thing. Sometimes you do need to take some cer certain supplements forever, but some things are just to get get you back into momentum. Yeah. So, that just has a preface, but definitely let's dive into the uh, the supplementation because I know there are the general ones that you can just walk into the the doctor's office and pick up for like, because iron isn't that expensive, but the ones that are like two dollars, <laughs> like those are even can be very constipating, don't mm -hmm. don't break down very well, um, can even have negative effects. So what what are what is someone to do when looking out for an iron supplement? What should they be looking for? So when it comes to iron supplementation, well, number one, you want to make sure that whenever you take an iron supplementation, you want to make sure you have a finger or a pulse on what the underlying cause is. Okay. Mm -hmm. So if you're a vegetarian or vegan and you've made a decision that you're just not going to incorporate meat, well, I th I think you're missing out because there's a lot of meat in there's a lot of good nutrients that are in <laughs> meat that you're not going to um, be able to get in certain vegetarian products. So, but if you've come to that decision and that's where you're at and you're at peace with that, well, you might want to add in some high quality iron support to keep your iron levels you know within the normal ranges that I mentioned. So first thing we can do something like liver pre-digested liver or whole liver capsules. Again, depending on if you're vegetarian, vegan, that may probably probably won't work. But some people can wrap their head around it. Well, if it's in a pill, it's okay. It's more medicine. So if that works for you, good quality liver capsules. That's a great start in the right direction. If not, we can do a chelated version of iron called ferrous glycinate. Ferrous glycinate is a really highly absorbable amino acid called glycine bound to an iron molecule. So when we do these chelation blends, they tend to work much better because the body soaks up the amino acid and absorbs it much better without causing constipation. Because your mm -hmm. conventional iron supplementations, ferrous sulfate that you get at the doctor's office, will get your stools nice and black and you just constipate you up a lot of times. So <laughs> not the best start off the bat. So we have our ferrous glycinate. There's, our, there's also some ferrous succinate. And then for a good vegetarian source as well, there's a product called Floridix, F-L-O-R-A-D-I-X. That's been around for about 100 years, and they have a, veg <laughs> they have a vegetarian uh, form of one, and it's liquid too. So that can be a really good, helpful kind of option. I go with the amino acid chelates because they absorb really well, and we'll talk about the females. The females I have a little bit different of approach to than my typical um, male counterparts just because of their cycle and what's driving iron can be a little bit different and more punctuated in females. So those are the, the blends right there. We have the iron chelates, succinic, um, we have glycinate, we have liver, and we have floridex. Yeah. And, and one thing I might want to add in is uh, Epic Bar is coming out with a, um, with a liver bar. Ooh. Uh, that actually, if you've tasted Epic Bar, Epic bar stuff, they're actually really good. And their liver one was actually good. And you don't really, you know, usually you think of liver and it's like, oh, it has that funny texture. So um, I guess today's unofficial sponsor of the day would be Epic Bar. <laughs> <laughs> We're definitely going to have to call them and, and hit them up for some free product after the show, I think. Oh, yeah. We, I, 
might as well. <laughs> Absolutely. So we kind of talked about, you know, the scenarios there, right? Vegetarian, vegan, that type of, you know, more of a nutritional dietary intervention issue. So something that works fine. Now, what if we have a whole bunch of inflammation? Well, if we've got a whole bunch of inflammation going on with some low iron and we run a comprehensive test that looks at some inflammatory markers like fibrinogen or let's say C-reactive protein or elevated homocysteine, we may want to be careful of adding iron back into the protocol because that can actually create more inflammation by throwing iron in there. Think about iron as like gasoline on the fire. Now with our female patients, it's a little bit different because there's a couple extra variables regarding females. So the, the advice I just gave already applies, but there's another element, and that is hormones. So a lot of times, most females' patients are having iron anemia because they're menstruating too much. They're having too much bleeding right at the end of their cycle, which starts their new cycle, essentially. So the biggest driving factor of that is estrogen dominance. When we have a higher amount of estrogen, typically our ratio is about 25 to 24 times more progesterone to estrogen. And when we start going below that ratio, right, so we start having 20, 15, 16, 13 times progesterone to estrogen, when that ratio starts dropping beneath 20 or so, we start to go in this estrogen dominance-like state, and that throws off our hormones because now that ratios aren't correct. And when we start menstruating, right, the drop in hormones at the end of the cycle is now delayed. We don't have that punctuated drop, and that can drive prolonged bleeding. And what's prolonged bleeding? When we're bleeding more three days or more a lot of times, and we're going through four or more tampons a day. If you're just going, using pads, for the most part, it's not an issue. Just one or two, maybe three tampons, not a huge deal. Once we go beyond three days and we're doing at least four tampons a day, that's an excessive menstruation and that could be driving a lot of the anemia. So when that situation comes, one of the things we do with most of our female patients is we eat, we consume liver while we're menstruating. Consuming liver while we're menstruating, we up the iron supplementation while menstruating. We continue taking iron throughout the cycle, but we have to put our focus on the female hormones and getting them balanced so we don't have this estrogen dominance driving this excessive menstruation. Yeah, basically, women take take care of yourself love yourself it's okay to well, just like you said you you have to eat those you know some people oh you know the liver traditionally in cult, other cultures if you're about to get pregnant well it's time to we're going to make sure that we save this liver just for you i mean i was going to eat it but we want to make sure that the baby comes out healthy you know or we want to make sure that we protect the mother and that's super important and if it was any other a uh, person that was like if you slit your arm and you you bled a normal amount, you just patch it up, you say, oh, I'll be okay. But if it just excessively started to bleed, you you would tell yourself, hey, this is getting dangerous. But we sometimes just say like, oh, I'm, it's just a heavy flow. It's, uh, But like you said, we have to be mindful that, hey, like our the blood in our body is literally the river in which nutrients are transported throughout our body and oxygen is transported. So like you mentioned, excessive, it, it's, it's normal to bleed, but excessive amount, it should be uh, an indication for you to, to look deeper into to what's actually going on. Absolutely. And I want to just reiterate one more thing because it may have been cut off there in the past was the fact that we got to be careful of inflammation too. If we're significantly inflamed, I mentioned some of the markers of inflammation. C-reactive protein, elevated fibrinogen, elevated homocysteine. These could be potential signs of inflammation. And if we're significantly inflamed, you've got to be careful in giving any iron supplementation when we're inflamed because it can drive more inflammation. So we've got to make sure we have our finger on what the underlying cause is. And we also have to make sure we have our finger on inflammation, what's happening in our body via inflammation. Yeah, definitely. Sounds good. Uh, anything else to, to add on to the iron side of things? I think we're ready to transition to um, macrocytic anemia. Let's go for it. So that's a, another uh, one of the big, um, I want to say, issues with a vegan or vegetarian diet. Not that it's – there's people that can totally do it, but 
you have to be very smart about where you get your supplementation. And that's one of the big things is uh, B vitamins. And uh, we, we, we kind of, I guess, get this idea that because it's so readily, we make it appear to be so readily available, almost like in these little uh, five-hour energies, people f start to forget about how important it really is. It's, oh, I just get my B vitamins for energy. But when it comes in, in that whole complex in food, when you're getting, you know, the B12, but also the folate, the B6, and all the other nutrients that you need in there as well, makes so much of a difference. So what's happening when someone is B12 or just B vitamin overall deficient? Um, what, what's, what's kind of the... The mechanism going on there. So we're talking about a specific group of B vitamins. We're talking about B9 and B12. So this is important. B9 is your typical folate. Now there's a lot of buzz out there on methylation. And there's this whole genetic SNP test out there called 23andMe. They're looking at a lot of genes, but a lot of my patients are bringing them in. And one of the key ones we look at is this MTHFR, which stands for stands for methyl tetrahydrofolate reductase. And the ACE at the end of that is indicative of it being an enzyme. All enzymes end in ACE. So this is an important enzyme that's there to help metabolize folate into activated MTHF folate. Now the issue is a lot of people today are taking folic acid. They're taking cheap supplements with folic acid in there. They're taking crappy fortified grains with extra folic acid, and they're going to have problems metabolizing folic acid into activated folate and could potentially even convert this folic acid downstream to dangerous metabolites. So what's the take-home message? We want to make sure we're using methylated B12, if not adenosyl B12, and we want to make sure that we're using activated LMTHF folate. This is activated. So then we're getting good absorption. Now, on top of that, another important vitamin for methylation is B6 or paradoxal 5-phosphate, P5P. This is an important B vitamin and P5P or paradoxal 5-phosphates is a active B6. So if we take good forms of these B vitamins, B6, the folate, the activated folate, the activated methyl cobalamin and or adenosyl cobalamin, we're on the right track because then we have activated nutrients. And typically with most of my patients that have B vitamin issues, right, B12 for instance, you're not going to be able to get much B12 in a plant-based diet. It's just not going to happen. You, the B12 analog in plants is not going to raise your B12 levels and there's been many healthy vegetarians that are very aware that they have to supplement B12 if they're going to go vegetarian or vegan long term. Yeah, a, a lot of them that I knew took a week weekly B12 shots, mm -hmm. which um, which when you take a B12 shot, it it you feel great, but uh, but having a, a necessity for it, it you know is is not where you necessarily want to be. If if you have the opportunity to kind of you know do a month of a week of booster shots for four weeks, then then go for it and take that at, advantage. Um, but to be very extremely dependent on it uh, isn't great either. So making sure that you are trying to get it uh, s through your food um, is, is super important. And yeah, the, the only only really, really, really rich B12 source I know of in a plant base, which is a little bit more expensive, um, but it's a, it's a healthy food, is spirulina. I know Energy Bits is, is a, it's a good form and the Hawaiian spirulina and uh, I think there's uh, Health Warrior. It would be one more, but those would be some good plant sources. But like you said, besides that, it, it's, um, eat some meat. <laughs> it, makes it, it makes it a little bit easier. Um, so w what about the the physiology in there? Like, w like why is the lack of the B vitamins um, have causing this this problem of anemia? Like, what? What, what do the B vitamins do inside of the red blood cells in order to have it function properly? Great question, Bear. So B vitamins, especially B, B9 or folate and B12 and B6, they're really important for the maturation of the red blood cells. So red blood cells are interesting, right? If we, you know, 
have a kid, right? It's if anyone has a baby out there, right? The baby starts really small and then grows big. But in the red blood cell world, the red blood cell actually starts out pretty darn big and then it gets smaller as it loses its nucleus. So what happens is we get these big goofy red blood cells, they don't, they're not able to lose their nucleus, so they stay really, really big. And we have these markers, like I mentioned, MCV, MCH, MCHC. These are just markers looking at how big the red blood cell is. And when we see the MCV, MCH, and MCHC elevated or high, that's a sign that the red blood cell is not maturing and there's potential for B12 folate and or B6 issues. Yeah. And just for um, those, again, who haven't taken an anatomy class, somebody might hear, like, wait, red blood cell loses its nucleus. Like, I thought all cells had that. Um, just for, for people out there, the nucleus uh, takes up energy and ATP, and that's probably not the best thing if you need that blood to just be a carrier of the oxygen. You don't want it to kind of use all the fuel before it gets to its destination. So that's... If, if anybody was wondering, like, what the heck doc, Dr. Jessel was talking about, um, that's kind of what's happening. It's going from this big, like, sphere-like thing. If you ever looked in, like, a, a, a microscope, you, you, you'll notice, like, the more purple-looking uh, lo things, uh, that's when it's still young and it starts to mature and it starts to go down and kind of create this, almost like this donut uh, shape. Or the, this little, like, kind of reminds me of a lifesaver, actually. <laughs> yeah, it does. It. it reminds me of right. a lifesaver, too. So when we see that, right, uh, it's important because we can use these tests, these um, blood tests to assess exactly how big your hemoglobin or blood cells are. I just want to run through those ranges for people that are listening. Yeah, so go for we, it. we have our MCV, anything 89.9 and above. MCH at anything at 31.9 and above. MCHC anything at 36 or above. So that that's a good kind of lab range off the bat so you know if you're getting your levels too high that there's a potential B vitamin issue. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, and, and and the B vitamins, these are uh the the solubility of them solubility of them it's water soluble so it's not that you're going to take too big of a risk um over overdosing on b12 now will you well b12 a lot of it does get stored in the liver so mm -hmm. the liver is a pretty big storage site of b12 that's why vegetarians can go so long because it will store it now other b vitamins B vitamins are typically um, water soluble, so if you excess on them, then you will over, you will kind of have extra B vitamins in your urine. You'll see the the urine get extra yellow. But with B12, it will get stored in the liver, and you can store a couple of months worth in the liver. So you got to be careful with B12. Uh, I typically go with anywhere between. 400 to 800 uh, micrograms, and we do it sublingually when we're doing it because we want to maximize absorption, because a lot of B12 issues, they happen because of gut inflammation too. There's another element to B12 that's, that's very unique that we don't see in iron, and that is pernicious anemia. And pernicious anemia is an autoimmune condition regarding the parietal cells. The parietal cells are these cells in your stomach that produce this compound called intrinsic factor. An intrinsic factor binds to B12, and then it goes down in your intestinal tract and gets absorbed in your ileum at the very end of your intestine. So duodenum, jejunum, ileum, the very end of your small intestine. Now, if we have this autoimmune condition where it's destroying the intrinsic factor, well, you're not going to be able to tag that B12 and absorb it downstream in the small intestine. So pernicious anemia is vital because if we don't rule that out, we could be giving B12 to the cows come home, but the intrinsic factor to absorb it isn't there. And then so these are the people that that not only should they be taking a sublink, what's probably like a necessity, or these are the people that might even, where I was talking about it being an option earlier, might even need the B12 injection injections is that correct yeah this is where b12 injections could be really really helpful with a condition like this 
it's shown that some of these sublingual may also bypass some of that because you can get it into the into the bloodstream through the the lozenger or drop form. But again, it's really important. If that's the case, we want to do the right test to know if that's the case. So we want to run intrinsic factor antibodies, and we want to run parietal cell antibodies. And it's important because 25% of Hashimoto's patients have this issue. So again, the sicker you get, the more we have these issues, and the more we have these issues, the sicker you get. So it's kind of like, you know, the, if you're not feeling too good, the, chance, the chances are that you have other elements, like the ones we're talking about with the pernicious anemia, uh, the chances are very strong. So you want to be working with a good functional medicine doctor that can run these tests and rule these other variables out. Yeah, definitely, because at that point, if you're still dealing with these hidden levels of stressors, you can be you can be like a, a dog chasing its tail. You're you're just reaching for the symptoms. So you want to make sure that you're not just you know spending a bunch of money on supplements, or I mean, you can even be eating the right foods. But if your body's not breaking them down correctly, if you don't have the right um, if your gut's not breaking it down and you're not actually absorbing those foods, then you're not actually healing. So we want to make sure that you're removing the things that are that are in your way and blocking you from healing, right? Yeah, um, and that may be cutting out gluten, right? It may be maximizing glutathione yeah. and vitamin D to help with the autoimmunity. I mean, these are vital things, even though they don't necessarily deal with taking the actual nutrient, but they have an amazing effect on cooling down the immune response that may be driving a pernicious anemia. So on that note, we have serum B12, and I'll run serum B12 sometimes. It's not a great marker if you're already taking B12 because the B12 is going to be in your blood. The question is, is it getting to your cells? Mm -hmm. Now, when that happens, we want to look deeper. And a couple of tests that can be run, you can run a, a urinary methylmalonic acid test. Mm -hmm. And methylmalonic acid is an organic acid, and typically that organic acid goes high when there's low levels of B12. So it's a really good indicator. So we need – methylmalonic acid gets metabolized when there's B12. So if there's not enough B12, guess what happens? It gets elevated. So when we see it go high – above you know, 14, 15, 16, 17, if I remember correctly, on my lab review papers, that's going to go up, and then that's going to be a sign that we're not getting enough B12 in the cell. There's also a couple other tests out there, one by Quest Labs called trans-holocobalamin. I have not used that marker yet. I typically just use the methylmalonic acid, but that's another marker out there you may want to be aware of. Yeah, definitely. Um so do we want to give a, uh, a quick summary, or is there anything else that you wanted to add on a specific note? Yeah, I think quick summary is, one, iron-based anemia. If we go back, actually, let's just start the B12-based anemia here. One, we want to make sure that, you know, if you're not eating animal-based products, there's a good chance you could develop a B12 issue just because of the fact B12 is primarily going to become, be, be coming from your animal products. You get some vegetable products, but they're analogs, and they're not going to have as much of an effect on your B12 levels. That's number one. Number two, figure out where it's caused, what the issue is. Is it gut inflammation, autoimmunity, or is it just a pure nutritional deficiency, or is it low stomach acid because you're not breaking down a lot of your foods well? Remember, the same cells that make intrinsic factor are the same cells that make hydrochloric acid. Those are your parietal cells, so don't forget that connection. And then next, choose the right supplementation. Methylated B12, adenosyl B12, sublingual. Make sure you're taking it with activated folate and more than likely a good spectrum of other B vitamins, at least high-quality B6. So that's kind of the whole summary for the, the B vitamin anemia. Do you want to add to that? No, I, I think you, you got it all down, and you even w went over a – some I, I I'm gonna I'm gonna mess up the way I'm saying this. Uh, pernicious anemia. Pernicious, yes. Pernicious. You also uh, got got some of that down there as as well. Uh, mentioning that, so we know that there's a, there could be an autoimmune condition to it too. So there's that one. There's the B vitamins that we want to make sure. And then of course, uh, the one that more people are familiar with is the the iron would be the. Uh, First or third, whichever way you want to, want to uh, order it. Yeah. So, yeah, and then so let's do definitely. a quick review of the iron, too, for everyone mm -hmm. that's listening. So iron, again, same thing. 
more than likely if you're eating too much plants, not enough animals, that's number one. Low stomach acid or, or gut inflammation, that's number two. And then number three is female patients with hormonal issues, estrogen dominance that are menstruating too much, they're going to be losing too much iron just out their menstruation because their female hormones are out of balance. Mm -hmm. Yes, definitely. And for the people out there, just to let you know, me and Dr. Justin, we love vegetables. We're not trying to hate on vegetables uh, in this podcast. Plants are awesome. Um, we just want to make sure that people are are not being so fearful of, of meat. And sometimes we have to kind of over express, express how uh, like how much we enjoy it just to show you that there, there's nothing to be scared of when it, when it comes to the meat. You're not going to... Um, as, as long as it, that's not the only, you're not 100% carnivore, um, but so as, as long as people know that we're not just trying to hate on vegetables just because, like we love vegetables, but like, you know, if you really want your bang for your buck, <laughs> you know. Exactly. I always tell my, my patients, I, I notice it myself, I eat more vegetables than most vegans do. Mm -hmm. And I post my meals on uh, Instagram at Justin Health, so you can take a look and see that. Again, a lot of people that are vegetarian based, they do a lot of starches and a lot of um, a lot of grains. So half my plate, over half my meal, is just good organic green vegetables and or non-starchy vegetables that are nutrient dense. So again, I, I practice what I preach too. But vegetables are an important part of the equation. But we can't forget that animals bioaccumulate plant matter, especially if Cows are eating grass, six to six to eight pounds of grass to make one pound of grass-fed meat. That's powerful. So when yeah. you eat a good quality grass-fed cow and have a good quality grass-fed ribeye steak, you're getting a lot of bio-concentrated nutrition. Exactly. Couldn't, couldn't have said it better myself. Uh, or, or maybe I could just say like, hey, your cow is almost like uh, <laughs> like a blender. <laughs> That's probably mean to say like, oh, it's a blender of uh, – <laughs> And you're just kind of consuming it. I'm a, I'm a, I, I used to tell people I was a secondhand vegetarian. I just, my cows eat grass, so therefore. Therefore, uh, yeah. No, I, I get what you're saying. Yeah, they're just a, a bioaccumulator of all of these uh, nutrients. So I think it's good. A combination of two. And, you know, the evidence scientifically shows that we're herbivores. Yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> let's let's <laughs> edit that out. Um, omnivores. And, again, some people will – do better off of more vegetables and a little less meat. Some people will do better with more meat and a little less vegetables. I think everyone kind of has to find their happy medium and what works for them. Yep. I think that's a really important thing there. So good show today, Barris. Anything else you want to add? Uh, I think that was great. Um, I, I know that people really need this information. Uh, I, I could be telling that to myself as well. So um, – just like all you guys out there, I'm going to make sure that I'm going to be mindful of my iron and my my B vitamins and making sure that I'm not allowing too many stressors uh, into my life or to make sure that my gut is doing well. So that way I can make sure that my blood is rich with with great, delicious oxygen. Uh, that's, a, that's a new nutrient. Um, yeah. So don't, don't forget it. So let's make sure that that our, our, our streams, our, our blood streams are filled with rich ox oxygen. And, and I would just uh, say one more thing, though, because I'm actually very mindful of this, too, is I'm giving blood a couple times a year yeah. and, or, and or doing lab tests because my iron levels are too high. And a lot of my male patients have iron, you know, maybe over 300 on the ferritin test. And if that's the case, you know, just make sure you're getting a couple of blood tests a year and or just giving blood once or twice a year. So that's a good way to get rid of that extra iron just to make sure you're not accumulating it as you're a guy because you're not menstruating every month like a woman is. Yeah. And, you know, homeostasis, you know, when you, you – you're going to help your body produce its own because you're going to say like, hey, where did that extra blood just go that went? I guess we got to make some more, right? So you, you could get some, some benefits um, for the males that have, you know, excess – it's not going to give you know give you excess of iron. You're going to take some of that out, but it's going to start to get back into its natural balance. So yeah, it's, find a red cross. Like there's people out there that can use your help. So not only can you help yourself, but help somebody else, and you know, and all of a sudden you're making your day happier, and you're you could be saving a life. So definitely donate blood, get some lab tests, keep yourself healthy. Um, 
I, I think I think we got a, a really good a good one here. I think we I'm I'm enjoying the the recline version of our of our podcast. Awesome. And just check out the translation of it, justinhealth.com slash podcast or, or go to beyondwellnessradio.com. Again, we look forward to chatting with everyone real soon. Okay. Thank you. Bye now. Got a question for Dr. J? Go to beyondwellnessradio.com forward slash question. Then tune in to hear the answer. Also, if you like the show, review us on iTunes. For more Beyond Wellness Radio, go to beyondwellnessradio.com.